All right, I'm Jim Mundorf of Lonesome Lands Podcast, and this one is with Jack Payne. And I always hate getting into politics unless it actually has a direct impact on agriculture. Um, and I feel like this coming election has a direct impact on agriculture. We have a candidate now who no one has voted for. She's just kind of been anointed, and, and she has been asked point blank, do you support restrictions on red meat? And she said yes. Um, she's, she's brought up the policies of price controls, which have been used before back in the 70s, which, which bankrupted a lot of ranches. Um, multi-generational multi ranches were lost directly because of price controls in the grocery store on beef. Um, and then the other ideas of, of taxing unrealized gains, um, implementing any sort of new tax, I feel like it always gets expanded um, to the point where it, where it hurts the entire country. Um, but, but definitely removal of the stepped-up basis that is back in into the policy of, of the Democrat presidential candidate and, and the removal of the stepped up basis would really, really hurt um, and make it impossible for a lot of these farms and ranches to get passed down to the next generation. And so I'm talking to Jack Payne, who's a Nevada rancher and um, sale barn owner, and uh, he's holding a rally for Trump to, to do, he's trying to do everything he can to, to keep Kamala Harris out of the White House. And I think that's that's a good deal. So um, we talked a lot about ranching and, and a little about his, his rally that he's trying to put on and what he's trying to do there with that. And so here is Jack Payne. Yeah. You know, I just grew up in Jordan Valley, Oregon. Uh, nearest town was Jordan Valley. Our ranch was on the Idaho side in Owyhee County. Um, homeschooled. And, you know, I had a pretty interesting ranch life growing up there. Just uh, my parents, my sisters and I. And just did kind of the, the rancher thing, you know, we didn't go to town much. We didn't have any power, um, read a lot as a kid. So that shaped, you know, my, my younger years. And then uh, when I did start going to school, you know, the first time they threw a football at me, I ducked. Yeah. <laughs> Cause I just never really grew up around other kids. You know, my cousins would come up, you know, certain times we'd play around, but that was usually with a rope or something. So it wasn't too much, uh, of the sports side of things, but yeah. So what, uh, what grade was that that you went to school? I see. I think I started going to public school in about sixth grade, I think. Yeah. And how far was that? Uh, it was about, it's about 30 miles. Pleasant Valley School. There was oh, just okay. a well, that's not too bad. Yeah. You didn't have to move to town like some of them, right? Well, yeah, we should have moved to town instead of driving that stupid dirt road every day, but. Yeah, I guess the dirt roads. And, and for people that there are ranch families where the wife and kid moved to town during the school year <laughs> while the, while the husband stays out at the cow camp. Um, yeah. or wherever I think my, he is. Mom, my mom was too worried to let us move to town because we knew how much she knew how much trouble would get in. <laughs> and she knew if she moved to town, she knew how much trouble my dad would get in. So <laughs> I think the only thing that we could do was commute, keep you together. But when the snow got really deep, we either went to school on snowmobiles or at that point we would stay with different neighbors. Uh, there's probably nobody in the town of Jordan Valley that I haven't stayed with, you know, as I was going to school. Cousins, family, friends, neighbors. Yeah. And when you were told me you're from Jordan Valley and if you're someone who follows kind of the cowboy stuff, which I've I've never made it really out to that area, but I've always been like fascinated with it you know i got a wade saddle and and 60 foot rope and all that stuff just because the guys who i've kind of followed on horsemanship and different stuff like that are are that kind of more of a buckaroo type i guess um but i and i've always heard about jordan valley so i assumed it was kind of a bigger bigger place but it's a tiny little town that has one of the biggest um kind of roping rope unique roping uh the jordan valley big loop rodeo which I've always heard about. And so I just assume you had a bigger town, but it's a tiny little spot, huh? Yeah, it is. It just blows up once a year. <laughs> huh? Yeah. It's pretty cool growing up there. Just, you know, the Jordan Valley rodeo, like, I mean, you looked forward to that all year. That was a, that was the big deal. So yeah. Everybody from the whole neighboring, every, every, all the ranchers come in for that one, huh? Yeah. The first time I met you in person was at, uh, I think when we were in Nashville for the U S cattlemen's and right. I saw your hat and I was like, damn, that guy looks like he's from Burns, Oregon or Jordan. Island. Yeah, that's and, sure. and I saw your hat and I was like, you don't look like you're from Nevada. 
yeah. I guess at least the Nevada guys I've talked to. Um, how come you're not all buckarooed? Oh, I don't know. I've always just been kind of the, I'll have to be careful what I say, but you know, the, some of the best cow, cowboys I've ever been around have a flat hat and some of the worst cowboys I've ever been around have had a flat hat. So yeah, in the rodeo world, we just kind of grew up, you know, nobody in Jordan Alley to speak of is kind of the, the flat hat crowd. They all got a, just kind of a cowboy hat. I mean, it's not really the, the hat that makes you a hand. It's what you can do. I've always yeah. said, I'd rather have a guy with his ball cap on backwards and long hair if he can get the job done, you know, and right. uh, so much anymore is all about how you're dressed and, the bits and spurs and saddles and that's all cool i mean I'm, I'm all into that stuff but one guy lets the cow get away and the other guy gets a rope you know that i'm going to make the decision on which guy gets your caught you grew up kind of around rodeo not really i mean it was just the jordan i rodeo kind of it was the big deal you know so yeah it was like and that's more of a buckaroo type deal with the long ropes and yeah yeah. yeah. So that's, you know, I mean, somebody asked me when I was five year old, five years old, what I was going to be when I grew up and I was going to be a bull rider, you know? So that was, yeah. They had so bull did you do that when you're young? Yeah. I rode bulls and saddle Bronx. Um, actually won way more money riding bulls than I did saddle Bronx. I just never was very good at, at cutting loose and spurring one. Um, we kind of grew up riding some pretty trashy horses that uh, would buck you off. And so it was, I was more about getting them rode than I was uh, the points. And, and another thing, you know, high school rodeo kind of shapes your, if you could stay on, you would win, which was the worst thing that could ever happen to you if you're wanting to be a good bronc rider, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so I was always shooting for the all around and I, you know, I could get by them, but I never could spur one very good. So. Hmm. Spent so a summer I, go ahead. I spent a summer in Canada and that, that kind of ended my bronc riding career because you can't get by them if you don't, uh, if you can't spur one, they're going to lawn dart you real quick because they're so big <laughs> and powerful. Yeah. Um, and so how'd you end up in Fallon? Uh, my mom and my wife uh, got to be good friends. And so uh, Rachel would come up there to see my mom. And I tell everybody that I met Rachel in the bar, but the truth is uh, my mom hooked us up. So. Hmm. <laughs> her, her dad had a ranch down here and, you know, we, we bought our first set of cows and, Cavs were freezing to death in Jordan Alley, and I, I'd been working for my father-in-law for a couple of years in Nevada on his ranch, and I was like, man, this this just doesn't make sense to uh, to try to cab in all this mud and snow and cold, because that's what he grew up doing, you know? Mm -hmm. So I called him and asked him if he had any room on, on his winter country for some cows, and he said, yeah, so I loaded them up, sent them down here, and just kind of started ranching in Nevada. We'd still send cattle to Jordan Alley for the summer. You know, it's good summer country. It's just not very uh, desirable mm -hmm. for winter after you've got down here and got spoiled you know running cattle outside year round and, and not having to feed hay it's it's really tough to go back there and spend your whole summer swatting skeeters and irrigating and baling hay to spend all the winter feeding it you know how far is it to me it seems like they're somewhat you know kind of the same kind of country but it's, it's a lot about 300 miles, exactly 300 miles 300 miles you're yeah. down in the tropics though compared to them in the winter time yeah, it's not that it's not that it's that much warmer here. It's just the kind of feed that grows here. You know, it's a soil type, oh. and you get all this browse. You know, everybody just looks at grass. When I first come to Nevada, I thought, "What the heck do they eat?" But yeah, you know, we you wean your calves in the fall, and your cows gain weight all winter. Turned out, and in Jordan, if you're not supplementing them with some pretty good hay and and stuff like that, they're they're going backwards. You know, so it's all about protein and what cows eat, and basically keeping the rumen bugs alive and and loosened up to where they can eat more, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And it's, um, and you're gathering with a helicopter and everything, everything. So the thing that I thought was interesting as I've learned more about like Nevada and, and it's, it's different than anywhere else. I think the way you guys operate, do you like your brand in year round? Is that right? Yeah, we brand, you know, the bulk of them get branded kind of March through June, but um, we've gotten our branding a lot tighter. The helicopters okay. helped a lot. Yeah. We don't, you know, I'm not like, it's not that we can't get it done horseback and stuff. It's just that with all the government regulations and the BLM and you got to have them here on July 1st and they got to be here by August 1st. Um, the only way to stay in compliance with the BLM on a ranch this big with no fences is to use a helicopter. If it wasn't for the government, we would just peck away at it like cowboys do and 
we'd get this chunk of country. It'd be cool, like to even bring it back a wagon or something, but that's just not an option because you got to get it done today. You know, they're out tomorrow to check to see if you're in compliance. Really? So they're that on you, huh? Well, they are on some of us. Then other neighbors haven't had their cattle to the mountain in seven years, you know? <laughs> and so you said no fences. You just have a perimeter fence or? Yeah, a lot of a large percentage of our country between us and our neighbors is not fenced. It's just, you know, mm -hmm. controlled by water. And, and a lot of times, you know, that's why the big outfits back in the day had reps and they'd go help the neighbors gather and get their cattle back. Yeah, and that's how like reading you you had your your viral post of your old sweetheart cow that's yeah. been out for how eighteen years or something is that what it was? At least eighteen years old. She's she's a beast. Right. Yeah. And so it's just a different kind of cattle. You sent me a picture one time. Maybe I'll try to look it up and put it in here where it was like a Jersey Brahma. It had it was the kind of the wildest looking cow. <laughs> It's seen, but that's, that's kind of, um, you guys do what you can to get, to grow cows, I guess. Um, yeah, the, the, we used to have a lot of milk cows, you know, we would, uh, buy a lot of late cabin cows out of our sale barn, you know, and in this, we haven't talked about the sale barn portion of this, which is a huge, huge chunk of our operation, but, uh, buy a lot of those late cabin cows that other ranches sold either because they were open or their vet called them open, but maybe missed them or the rancher just told them, Hey, if they're not Kevin by the first of May, just call them open, you know? So we buy a lot of those kind of cows and then we should have just left them alone and let them calve in June again the next year. I've learned the long way, but uh, we were trying to get those calves pulled off those cows and get them to cycle back, you know, catch them up, get them back into March. So we had a bunch of nurse cows. We'd be pulling those calves off and grafting them on. And, and I had some Brahma bulls that I put on my Hereford cows, you know, to make F ones and, uh, had a couple of bulls that were kind of long footed or couldn't get around as good or whatever. So I put them on my nurse cows and, uh, so yeah, we had these half Jersey, half Holstein F1 <laughs> and uh, you wouldn't believe it, but just kicked them out as like four weight heifers. And some of them have made really good cows. It's yeah. surprising. You'd think they'd have too much milk and just fall apart, but yeah, you know, we did around. the way, um, the, the dairy industry is full of trick, but don't tell them because uh, there'd be that many more pounds of Holstein beef on the market if they knew. <laughs> yeah. Um, so are your bulls out? Cause I know a lot of ranches up there have their bulls out year round. Is that our yours? No, we, we try to turn our bulls out in June. We don't want to calf too early. Um, yeah. then we pull those bulls by, Oh, you know, we don't want to be calving in too late. Like you can calf to November. You know, we kind of got, we kind of have okay. three calf. It's like, an old rancher here in Fallon, Larry Kite, told me one time, he said that we don't have summer calves. He said we have late spring and early fall, which is what he called a July calf, you know. <laughs> so <laughs> anyway, we don't want to calve too late in the fall because they're going to freeze to death. And any cow that calves from December through February here, they're going to get pretty thin time green grass comes. And uh, Rachel's uncle, Marvin Casey, told me once, he said a cow that calves in April will, will always calve in April. And so I've always, uh, I've watched that and he's right. You know, if a cow calves in February, she gets too thin by the time green grass comes and then she's, she's either going to be open or she'll be late. And mm -hmm. a cow that late, you know, is going to get later, but a cow that calves in April after she's had a week or two of green grass, they just clean so much better and, and cycle back better. And calves are healthier. And those calves seem to outgrow the ones born in February anyway. So what's the point of fighting the predators and, yeah. and mother nature? You know? Maybe them bulls out year round, it's not on purpose. <laughs> yeah we, you probably have some running around the way you talk yeah we do but like that's another thing with the helicopter we're you know we buy a lot of sale barn cows so we're very concerned about trick so we test our bulls twice a year um there's lots of ranchers in nevada say that well we just can't trick test because we can't get them gathered but we got as many acres as anybody and, and as rough as country as anybody you can get them gathered if you want to yeah, yeah. <laughs> just how hard you want to try huh yeah but so you like sale barn situation we just don't want to because we use a lot of those bulls on on like open cows we buy in the fall through the barn and then we want to put them back on our base herd in the spring and we sure don't want to be taking trick from open cows and putting it back on you know getting it into our, our base herd so we are really strict on getting everything gathered and getting them trick tested yeah and so your sale barn how'd you end up at the sale barn nevada livestock market yeah um well, like I said, we owed the bank a lot of money and had our first set of cows and we, uh, 
got ready to sell our calves. You know, we just, there, there was only two sale barns in the whole state of Nevada at that time. And uh, we took them to the one that we thought that they would do the best at. And uh, it wasn't ran too well and it was really slow. And there were some big buyers there and cattle were bringing really good money. And I thought we were going to be in pretty good shape. And the sale kind of stopped because they had some cattle that couldn't get sorted or something. And anyway, all the buyers, the big buyers, you know, that were paying the top dollar, they just got up and left. And there we were to sell our annual calf crop to make our payments. It was all on the line for that minute. You know, that's what people don't understand about the auction business. It, it comes down to one minute out of the year, whether you're going to make money or lose money. Right. So uh, the market dropped like 20 cents, you know, when those guys left and, and we took it in the shorts big time. So it was kind of at that point, I was like, there's a lot of cattle in the state and so many of them are leaving going out of state because they're not getting a, a fair deal here. So we took a big risk and the one cell barn shut down we went to the landlord that, that owned it and leased it from him and started Nevada Livestock in 2006. And you're not an auctioneer. <laughs> I can't count to 10. So um, <laughs> yeah, a lot of, I don't know, I guess maybe around here we have. And so that's the other interesting point. You said there's two um, sale barns in Nevada. Yeah. in the whole state, they're both in the same town. <laughs> they're both in Fallon and yeah, you're kind of on the edge, right? You're, you're up in kind of that, right next to California. How far from California are you? Yeah, we're, we're kind of actually, so we're not 100% central, but we're more central. And that's one of the big draws that pulls cattle out of Nevada is uh, sale barns like Twin Falls and Orland and, um, you know, Cedar City, Utah. They're all kind of, most of the cattle in the state are in that outside perimeter. And so those sale barns are just right across the border. So it just makes sense for somebody in Southern Nevada to haul their cattle to Utah than it does to come third of Fallon. Okay. Unless the market's, you know, that much stronger here, then people got to weigh that out. Yeah. All right. And that's going to be the site of ranchers, uh, ranchers for Trump, right? Yep. How'd you come up? So you did this in 2020, right? Yeah. And Don Jr. was there. How'd yeah, you come we, up with that idea back then? You know, uh, D. Mardall, um, he's a good guy, a rancher from Nevada, and it was kind of his idea, and he he pitched it to me, and so we just ran with it, you know? Yeah, and so did you do all the same stuff back then? You had the roping and all that? No, or we didn't have any of the roping events. Uh, it was all kind of last minute, to be honest with you, because uh, we didn't know that Don Jr. was coming until like the day before. Um, mm -hmm. That's why on this one, we've started so much sooner trying to get the word out and trying to kind of get it, who's coming to speak, nailed down so that so that people know you know right so it was kind of a surprise last time huh? it was yeah it was like it was always kind of thrown out there that he might show up he might show up but we didn't get confirmation until just the, the last minute you know uh-huh and we so for this one we'll just go through everything you're doing yeah so so the the campaign's very concerned about um like auction i don't know if if it's illegal or what so you got to be real careful about how people donate you know you can only donate through a personal check or credit card to the campaign. You got to fill out all the proper paperwork. So it's really tricky to make sure any donations are are hundred percent legal to not get the campaign and in, in trouble. You know how jumpy the other side is and, and they're going to go after them for anything that they possibly can. So yeah, uh, this one we got, uh, you know, we're going to have the rally, the speaker, um, we're working hard to try to get uh, Congresswoman Harriet Hageman here to talk about the, uh, her bill, you know, opposing mandatory animal ID, uh, working with her, with her campaign to try to get her here. And then just whoever we can get from the campaign, working hard, kind of doing the grassroots uh, groundwork uh, with surrounding states around us, you know, just calling ranchers in those areas and letting them know what we're doing. And they're reaching out to their neighbors and friends to, to gather up cattle. Um, you know, our goal is to get somewhere between 500 and 1,000 head of cattle donated. But like I said, we, we got to send them the check for for what their cow brought and then they have to write the personal check to the campaign all right gotta be pretty clear about that <laughs> yeah it's a pretty, uh paperwork headache but we just got to do it legal you know what what were the roping events yeah they're just over at the fairgrounds just like a muley roping and, and girls breakaway and girls steer stomping and team branding kind of a an open team branding and then a, a mixed you know which would be two guys two girls or two guys and two kids or two guys and a a a lady and one kid. So that's a pretty fun one there because it's, you know, people can bring their families. And, 
And so were you always planning on doing this? Uh, it, don't tell my wife, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the last one was a ton of work. I mean, because it was our yeah, first Yeah, I one. can't imagine. And it seems like it's, you said this one, you have a lot more notice, but it seems like, I mean, maybe you've been doing a lot up until this time and, and getting that date nailed down, but it seems yeah. like this one ain't that much of a notice. What, what we got three weeks? Maybe. Yeah, it's, it's creeping up on us real quick. We've been, you know, reaching out to the campaign for six weeks and just haven't gotten a lot of feedback. But you know, we we don't give up easy, so we've been right. We've been hounding them, and, and we're getting closer. You know. <laughs> Are they, why do you think that is? No I, feed, little feedback, or yeah, I don't know. Just couldn't. Tell. I think just uh, well, you know how how hard it is to get employees and to get people to do what you want them to do, and if you're trying to. I mean, I'm just trying to run a ranch with a few employees. I know how hard that is. What if you were trying to reach out across the nation and build a build a ground game, you know? Yeah, but I would think. I would think this would be the ultimate photo op. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, in, out in the middle of nowhere, cattle country. And and like you said, Nevada is kind of a toss-up. Um, they, they are a swing state. Yeah, I was watching last night. I was watching Fox News, and and they were doing all these analysis, you know, and, and pretending this and pretending that. And, and they got down, and they said Nevada was so close that they actually gave it to Harris, which motivates me that much more because if if we're that close, we actually could make a difference. Yeah, and that's the whole motivation, I guess. Is and yeah. I've talked about that before on some of this politics stuff. You get into it, and then when you lose, you kind of always look back and be like, well what what else could i have done right like and i feel like you're one of those guys where whatever happens you you're probably you're doing it all you're you're doing everything you possibly can yeah what if we get to the end of this deal and and it's like 300 votes or something you know yeah and And then do the campaign ad we're we're working at the film crew to get a campaign ad made we don't know if if the trump administration or the trump campaign will use our ad but we want to get a bill to present it to them to, to hopefully use the money raised in this event to run that ad. You know, our theory is that everybody is voting based off of emotion and they're either pro-life, they're pro-choice. They've already got their mind made. They either hate Donald Trump or they love him, but nobody is voting with the thought of, of possibly being hungry. You know, what do they say? We're only three meals away from, from mayhem. Right. As far as what's in the store. Yeah, they stock uh-huh. those big grocery stores in those cities like three times a day. So if Kamala's policies lead to red meat caps and price controls, um, it won't be a matter of her limiting people from eating red meat. It's just that we won't be in business anymore. So the red meat won't won't be there. And we hope that people can think back to the days of uh, COVID when the grocery, you know, the meat counter was was empty and um Hopefully that resonates with people where they think about that when they when they go to cast their vote. It's it's more than just your emotions. Um, what if you can't buy beef? Yeah, and that's one thing I'll probably try to hit on multiple times. It's like you talk about how there's people who hate Donald Trump or people who don't. But when you have a presidential candidate who said, I mean, she was asked point blank, "Do you support restrictions on red meat?" and she said yes. I mean that's you can hate somebody as much as you can, but you cannot vote. I mean, if you believe in agriculture, especially the beef business, you just cannot vote for somebody that says that. Um, right. And even like the health and all that you get into all that stuff. Um, it's just having restrictions on food is, is the ultimate like communist <laughs> ideal. I feel like. Yeah. Um, and, and so that's why, that's why I wanted to have you on and, and, you know, let you talk about that stuff, but also kind of, if you look back on, and you had mentioned this, I guess, look back on last Trump administration and how kind of wrong things went there a little bit, um, as far as who was helping him out or, you know, who had his ear as far as ag policy and different things like that. Um, you know, Sonny Purdue is somebody I've talked about as you know, they gave millions of dollars to JBS and some of the Packers during, during the Trump years. But, um, just because, so I feel like things like what you're doing here. And I think you mentioned that too, like this would be a good thing to actual get actual ranchers and and maybe get more actual ranchers, have more of a voice in, in the next administration. 
Yeah, that's definitely our goal. I mean, for goal number one is to get Trump elected. I mean, we got to focus all of our attention on that. But but after that, it would be nice if grassroots ranchers, I'm talking independents, I'm talking, you know, even if they are part of a cattleman association, just to have a voice to to say, hey, we don't want to go down the same road we went down last time. I mean, it, it was year four of Trump's last administration when he did that press release where he talked about imported beef, like he right. just out about it. Like, did they honestly have him that insulated that he didn't know about imported beef? Because the ranchers were all screaming it from the rooftops, you know? Yeah. So it's our goal here to, to, to have a voice to cut through the leaders of the Cattlemen's Association. I don't care what association you're with. The independent ranchers need to have a voice. Yeah. Yeah, get Harriet Hagman out there and have her be Ag Secretary. Yes. Uh, <laughs> Massey, anybody like that. I mean, we this whole thing of, of, of taking these cattle from Nevada and shipping them to Nebraska to, to fatten them, to ship them back to California to the consumer, mm -hmm. like it doesn't make any sense to me. Why, you know? Yeah. If, if you want to be green and you want to save uh, the environment, why are you putting this cattle on a truck 1,500 miles to, to ship boxed beef back 1500 miles that just doesn't make sense and you know during, during covid you had all the grants and all this money that was supposed to go to open up more of these mom and pop butcher shops so that we didn't have these bottlenecks and all that but mm -hmm. in my opinion just the opposite happened like i think the big four started reading the comments on social media and said look at all these people talking about buy local like we're going to lose 10 percent of our market share if we don't get these little mom and pop shops shut down because everybody's wanting to go, go buy from their neighbor. But you know, that, that's what would be great about the Massey act or something like that. If, if, if people could have the right to buy from their neighbor without all the government right. risk, you know, prime act is what you're prime saying. Act, or, yeah. 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 Where you can, you know, that's the, the main thing with that is your local locker has way more restrictions in, in government red, red tape. They got to jump through than the, the lockers in Brazil that we are importing this meat from and and the people who are running them have been the most corrupt you know they've they've pled guilty to bribing health inspectors you know all that kind of stuff and then and then we can't go to our local locker you know i'm right next to nebraska we can't go to our local locker and sell meat to to people 30 miles away from us that we raise on our place yeah that's, the, that's where it's really ridiculous and and yeah it's i think just looking at how things are kind of turning out, just the fact that, you know, that's RF Kennedy Jr. thing. It's strange to me. I was just thinking about how, like, you know, Trump was a big pusher of, uh, you know, I hate to say the, the V word, you know, Trump was a big pusher of it. And RFK was the biggest kind of um, you know, opponent of it. And for, you know, Trump hasn't came out and said, well, I was wrong or, you know, right. screwed that up. But I feel like he almost has by just bringing in, by bringing in RFK Jr. Um, and there's some interesting things going on in agriculture as far as the, the people that he's been talking to. And you want to have Hagman on because of her, you know, she's mainly gotten a lot of big fans in the agriculture community because she has come out with this ban on mandatory electronic identification. Um, and I thought it'd be curious, like what would, and I've talked about this before, you know, but if you're not familiar there is now a rule USDA is going to, in November, all cattle of 18 months or older of a certain age, I guess, a breeding cattle, when they cross state lines, they'll have to have a mandatory electronic identification ear tag in their ear that can be read by an electronic reader. Um, and I've talked about how this is getting the toe in the door. The USDA has come out and said they have planned for all cattle from birth to slaughter to be required to have these ear tags. Um, and what would that do? Just like, I guess, from a rancher point of view, from a sale barn point of view, how big a pain in the ass is that whole deal going to be? Well, Nevada is a bang state. So we have to bang every single heifer before she sells. And it's a pretty hefty fine if one gets out of here, not bangs. So we already know what it's like to put half your cattle through the chute before the sale. Right. And now we'll be required to put them all through the chute before the sale. Of course, a lot of the heifers that come in here are already bangs because the rancher did it. So if we have a 7,000 head feeder sale, we're not bangs in 3,500 heifers. We're bangs in 1,500 to 2,000. And when you're trying to get people's cattle sorted and fed and ready for market 
to have a full-time crew processing 1,500 to 2,000 heifers leading up to the sale just to stay in compliance with the state laws, which on the EID would be federal, obviously, but it's an absolute nightmare. So now picture a 7,000 head sale where we have to put an EID in, in all the heifers and all the steers. Um, and we have to start 10 days before. Nobody wants to send their cattle in 10 days before. Yeah, and It's just it's a nightmare. It, it isn't going to happen. It isn't going to work. But if it's a government mandate, you know, we just get sick and tired of the sale barns having to be the one that carry the water for the Nevada head tax, for the checkoff, for the brand inspection. Anytime somebody's done anything wrong, they make us hold the, the customer's check. The customer comes in the sale barn and says, I'm here to pick up my check. My wife has to tell them, well, you can't have your check. Nobody from the Department of Ag calls them and, and tells them that they can't have their check. It's always a sale barn. And um, that we just keep getting more and more pushed on us. And now it'll be this mandatory animal ID deal that we just can't can't handle. Yeah. That was one thing I thought was interesting. You said people bring in cattle. How many days usually ahead of the sale day? You know, we feed pretty well here. Um, buyers always complain the cattle are too full. So, you know, we try to get people to send their cattle in early so that we have time to get them worked and the heifers banged and all those things. You know, you, you picture, uh, you know, big sale barns back east where those cattle are all coming in day of. Can you imagine trying to bang all those heifers? Yeah. And then just the shrink on them, you know, um, it stresses them. It's hard on them. It gets them stirred up, gets them wild, gets them mad. It takes a day two, a day or two for them to settle down and, and go back to eating and drinking. So. We get a lot of our cattle in for a Friday feeder sale. We'll get a slug of cattle in on like a Monday, Tuesday. Oh, I wanted to go back to before we go any further on the, the imported beef. You know, there's so much uh, put on beef quality assurance and all these different things you're supposed to do. BQA certified. I mean, you open up any one of these ranch magazines, there's multiple pages talking about BQA. And I always just wondered like, okay, so that meat shows up here and gets processed and gets mixed with our beef. But that beef coming in isn't BQA. They, they're probably still giving a shot in the butt, you know. Um, just don't understand the, the hypocrisy there of, of, of why we have to jump through all these hoops. I, I know we're doing the right thing. I know we need to give the shots in the neck and, and handle the cattle right. But I just don't understand how that beef can just pour in and get mixed with it. And none of that matters. It, it doesn't matter how those were handled. I'd like somebody a little further up the, the chain to explain that to me, why it's a, a non-issue, you know. Yeah. Yeah, and that's I just did a a talk where I talked about how they said that and I can't I think it was like seventy percent of consumers are it help they're they're glad that BQA exists. I can't remember what it says, but most consumers have no idea what and what BQA is beef quality assurance and it's just a a regulations mainly on I feel like around here it's mainly truckers that have to do it. Do you have to do it at a sale barn? Like do you have to take the tests and all that? No, nobody, you know, I think the, the cattlemen's came in and give a talk to our employees years and years ago. It's, you know, what I see it as mainly is just how you get the shots and, and where, you know. Yeah. And I'm not, not the thing about it. that is like, you know, if you're a first time cattle person or, you know, you're just trying to buy a few calves and, and, you know, there's good information out there that should be good information to have. But, you know, around here we have big, there's a big packing plant, I think is Grand Island where all these truckers have to go through this BQA to, to haul cattle. And then they had to sit with their cattle in, in line for like hours <laughs> in the truck because yeah. they couldn't get them unloaded at the packing plant, you know? And so, yeah. Cause the packing plant don't, I mean, I suppose they have to go through it all too, but yeah. yeah. And then, but yeah, that goes back to the same thing as, as your local locker. Cause there's no BQA in Brazil or Argentina or all these companies that, all these countries that now imports are up. Um, I saw something like 40%, a lot yeah, of them. I think 89%. And yeah. I think that's the Joe Biden kickback deal to somebody that did, you know, 10%, 10% for the big guy, you know? Yeah. It's crazy when you, when you like look at those numbers. Mouth. Yeah. Highest foot and mouth. So it's like, if, if we're so worried about disease traceability and we have to have mandatory animal ID in order to, to trace disease, but we're shipping, our imports are up 89% from Paraguay, which is known to be the highest level of foot and mouth. Like somebody explain that to me. Yeah. Well, has anybody ever said like foot and mouth disease has been eradicated in the U S since 1929. Have, have you ever heard anybody say why you hear about traceability, traceability because of foot and mouth. Have you have like, why all of a sudden out of nowhere, 
oh, do we have foot and mouth disease? Have you ever heard anybody even try to explain that? No. Yeah. And so like, I've been talking with Brett, Brett Kenzie, who I've had on before and stuff. And he sent me, um, the foot and mouth disease and how it, how it can be transferred. And it's all from imports. And it's because our, we have open borders. I mean, it could come across on somebody in somebody's clothes mm -hmm. that's coming across the border. I, mean, I think we have a higher chance of getting brought across by humans than we do than we do cattle, but that's, yeah. you know, that weakens the argument of, of slowing down imports. We should. Slow well, they down. say, I think also it, it exists in chilled meat. It can exist in the meat. And so, you know, however, you know, if it gets into who, who knows how, you know, it's cloven hooved animals, which are pigs, they can get it. And so, you know, if a pig gets into some meat and yeah, I mean, it's just, but it is very super contagious and that's why there, there's such a, but also the, their deal is they want to be able to regionalize it. And from what I've read, the only way to regionalize it is if you like, as far as like world trade organization and that kind of stuff is if you have electronic ID tags. And then if you're able to regionalize it, then you can still sell meat. You can still export your meat to wherever from the regions that don't have it. That's why we can still get, um, that's why we're still importing beef from Brazil when they have foot and mouth diseases because they, and this is all self-regulated. So we are trusting the Brazilians that they're saying, well, this comes from a region that hasn't had foot and mouth disease for right. however long. That, that already went to prison for bribing USDA. Uh, right. And then ones that just kicked out said Twitter can't exist in their country, I'm pretty sure, because of, you know, you can't have people, you can't have free speech there. Yeah. Um, and to me, the whole import beef, uh, they call it producer profitability. Uh, there's so many things we can get into in the weeds as far as, these big fires out west that are burning up so much of this country, it's because people can't run cattle anymore. And, you know, I encourage people to run more cattle and, and graze their grass off so they don't burn it. But if you're already up against it financially and high hay prices from a couple of years ago, people are still trying to dig out of that hole. And so what if, what if the BLM or the state or even on your private land, what if they came along and said, run more cows, please, let's stop fires. Right. More cows has to be profitable. Yeah. Or you, you can't afford to do it. And with today's high interest rates, so I'm saying, okay, if we're going to fix the fire problem, cows could be the tool to do that. But running cattle has to be profitable. And right. so many people, I mean, I've talked to people this week that said they're voting for Kamala because cattle are higher under a Democrat than they are a Republican. I mean, the reason cattle are high right now is because cattle have been so low, you know? These it's are like, ranchers? Yes. It's crazy. It, it is just, crazy. I mean, they're all out there. And that's one of the reasons I didn't want to get into politics because I feel like they, we got enough people talking politics. But when you have a candidate and the other, I mean, we talk a lot about the meat restrictions, but the whole, what does she call it? Unrealized gains, um, that kind of stuff. They want to get rid of stepped up basis for, ins um, which I haven't read as much as I probably should have on that for inheritance. Um, that kind of stuff will destroy these family family run um operations and, and people say well you you know that's only for people over 100 million well what's that going to do to to the entire market if you're getting taxed i mean that would precipitate a market crash if anything right like our yeah. ranch for example i think about this I and mean, we're not over 100 million obviously but we bought it for six million these ranches double in value every 10 years um, if we had that ranch appraised now, it'd probably be in the, you know, 15 to 20 million range. Right. So you're, you know, you're okay. 15 million minus six. Now I owe taxes on 9 million. Yeah. Even though, you, even though you're struggling with your calf crop to, to make the payment. It'll and end. Goes, yeah. And that goes back to the stepped up basis deal. Like if you want to pass it on and right. they're going to, your kids would have to pay taxes on the difference between, you know, if they get rid of stepped up basis and I'm sure there's all kinds of different, you know, technicalities in there, but the, the main thing is you owe taxes on what your parents paid for it and how much it's worth. Now, the difference you owe taxes on those, that difference. Yeah. Um, and then when it comes to land, most people that have a lot of it can't afford, it <laughs> can't afford those kind of payments. Right. Um, or tax bills without selling out. And so then when you sell out, who's buying it? Well, you know, Bill Gates has become the biggest farmland owner in the past few years. And, um, 
you know, it, it, it's crazy what, what could happen, but. That's one of the things on this rally that we're encouraging farmers to be, to be a part of it because, you know, a couple of years ago, the cattle were low and hay was high and people were looking at the hay cost. It was going to cost more to feed the cow through the winter than the cow was worth. So they sold out and, and now hay is cheap, cheap and, and cattle are high. You know, it's just this, this swing, this pendulum just swings one way and then the other. And, um, we need to, if we could make grazing great again, if we could make ranching profitable again and keep it profitable, not just one year at a time, like 2014, if we could make it profitable, then ranchers could get back to running more cattle again. And then hay farmers would have somebody to sell the hay to. If, if, if these hay prices don't get higher, there's going to be a lot of farms going under and there we are now, who's going to buy it. Is it going to be China? Is it going to be Bill Gates? Yeah. It, it, that's worst case scenario. Best case scenario is to have a big corporation buy it. And and that's not what's best for, for the local community. I mean, my, my thought is uh, keep it local, keep that family on the ground, keep their kids going to school. Like the, we talked at the beginning you know, the little school I went to was K through eight. There was just two of us in, in my class, you know? And yeah. so. Uh, yeah. My elementary school doesn't exist anymore. <laughs> right. And there was, you know, 30 and, but they're all consolidating around in where i'm at they're just yeah. everything's consolidating but every better education under that that one-on-one -on -one with their teacher or are they going to get a better education if there's 100 kids in the class you know it's yeah. going to be one-on-one -on -one. so that's it's just yeah. a direction we're headed that i don't like and that's why you know people ask me boy i talked to a guy this morning he's like you've got a lot more to lose having this trump rally than you do to gain as far as as a business owner don't, don't doesn't that worry you and i'm like that doesn't even cross my mind because it's, it's all to me. It's about the big picture, you know? Right. Yeah. I guess I never thought about that. Is that, did you ever um, think about that before you held the first one or holding this mm -hmm. one? No, no. <laughs> but that's interesting when you say that, that, you know, people, you know, ranchers that are going to vote for her just because cattle prices are up. Yeah. If I lose a customer because, because he wants to vote for Kamala, like, I'd wear that as a badge of honor. You know? <laughs> yeah. Adios. Huh? Adios. Yeah. Let's, <laughs> let's save our country. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I mean, and that is insane. The, the, that, you just kind of blew my mind that there's a rancher who says cattle prices are up. So I'm voting for, and the other thing about cattle prices are up. Well, how many, you know, the herd's not expanding and that just goes to show you how, how kind of ranchers live. You know, you can have cattle prices, record cattle prices, and they have zero confidence in what's going to happen, you know, yeah. six months from now because of how it's been. Um, and I think that just goes, says a lot about the the kind of climate that you have to, you have to make a living in. Yeah. I think that's what's made, you know, the LRP so, so popular is like, just going into this selection. If you own a bunch of cattle and you're not protected, um, I've never had an LR. I guess I had an LRP a couple of years ago on a slug of yearlings, and then the market went up, and I just kept waiting for the bill to come in the mail. And then one day I got a big check. I couldn't believe that that uh, we got paid on those cattle because the market had gone up. But in this in this uh, election cycle, I'm, I'm obviously pretty nervous, and I'm a very optimistic guy. Way too optimistic usually, but yeah, I think I just don't see how it can turn out good. Well, you're, I don't know. I've talked to guys who think the world's going to end. So, you know, or the civil war or whatever, yeah. you know, it, there's just, when you think about what's happened, even within the last couple months, it's, it's not, you know, they, they tried to kill him. Biden gets pushed out. Kamala gets put in there. And that's what I was saying about if you're a Democrat and you're watching this all pissed off, I feel like the, the people who should be the maddest about Kamala being the nominee are the Democrats. Like you got zero, you got zero put input. You got your voice means nothing to that party. Right. Because, you know, I went to the Iowa caucus where we sat down and we voted for the nominee we wanted, you know, and, and that's, and so then at the end of the day, if your guy isn't in there, you still feel like, you know, you had somewhat of a vote, somewhat of a right input, but just to have them, and it seems so premeditated <laughs> the way it happened. Yeah. And, and so, yeah, I mean, you can't, I don't know. And, and that's the choice you have, you know, so that's the choice you've been given. So. Yeah. 
But uh, these poor ranchers out here, you know, especially if you run on any federal land, I mean, they're just, they're coming at you from every angle, every day, a new, you know, the, they're shoving a new monument through in Oregon. And, yeah. uh, you know, we got this big Navy expansion. They're taking a bunch of our country. You know, you just start looking at all the things that are, that they're using to put ranchers out of business. Um, the wild horse populations that are, they're just growing up, you know, out of control. They have these AMLs, appropriate management level, um, it says in the law that they're supposed to keep those horses at that number, but uh, we, we got a neighbor that's supposed to have 12 horses on his ranch and has 600, it's 50 times over. Our ranch is supposed to have 900 and we had over 4,000 they gathered last year. But you know, if you take his his percentages of, of 12 to 600, that would be like me having 50,000, you know? Um, yeah, and you, you can't do anything with them? No. It, like you're not supposed to just leave them alone, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Let them drink your water. Um, you know, Nevada, ran Nevada is very unique in the water laws, like the ranchers own the water. The The federal government, you know, claims that they own the public land that, that your cattle are running on, but it's it's very unique that we have strong water law. And so we we hold the water rights. So there's all these wild horses drinking out of, you know, you, you see like on, on the internet about the evil ranchers just trying to run more cows and, and these poor horses. Well, they don't understand that those horses don't even have a water right to be there. I'm surprised that ranchers haven't gotten together and done a class action lawsuit and, and sued the government for, for illegally using their water. You know, the problem with ranchers is we, you can't get two of us to agree on anything. So, yeah, <laughs> but that's in, but it goes back to what, you know, the goal kind of what we should have is just to have somebody like you explain those issues that almost nobody knows about. Um, you know, like you talked about, the Navy took how many acres? The Navy's taken a uh, hundred thousand acres just of our of our public land um, that you're running cattle on. Hundred thousand acres, all all winter country, yeah. And then they're taking four hundred thirty nine acres of our land just in eminent domain, just taking it. And, and what's crazy about it? It's the only private property left in that valley. It's called Dixie Valley. It's just a big old Nevada desert valley with a big old alkali flat. And um, on the north end, there's some farms. But down in this in this area where they do their training, it's the last private property. So I think that BLM permit we have there is 100,000 plus acres. And it's the only property, private property we can gather into to ship out of, to camp, build trails, leave your saddle horse overnight. They're just taking it. So we will have this, you know, huge allotment down there with nowhere to gather to or anything. And then the Navy came in, not the Navy, but the state came in and ground up the highway. There was a paved road in there. My wife's mom drove school bus in there in the early 70s and, and it was paved and it was paved up until a couple of years ago then they went in with the state and ground up a paved road and made it back into dirt and the washboards literally are, are six inches deep when you go down that road with a loaded cattle truck about 10 miles an hour is as fast as you can go and so they, the the navy says boy we're really upset that the county or that the state uh ground that up but okay you're, you're taking my land in eminent domain to get people out of there and you're going to try to tell me that grinding up the highway is just coincidence. Like people used to go down there and camp like crazy, big, fancy RVs and side by sides. And now nobody goes there. It's, it's a ghost town because you can't get there without, I mean, you imagine going down there in your hundred thousand dollar RV and you get there and all your dishes are on the ground broke and, you know, be in parts. Yeah. So it, it's pretty crazy. And then, uh, you know, the wild horses, the, the wolves, um, I don't think that's all just coincidence, you know, look yeah. at California. They, they stopped hunting, lions with dogs and that's illegal so now the lion populations have absolutely blowed up to where there are no deer so as easy you know you get further down the road and and crazy things can happen you know maybe i'm the conspiracy theorist but people in those cities don't have any food they're they're going to come out to the country and try to find something to eat and if the deer population has gone i mean my thing is i just believe that their big plan is to control food and if there's an independent rancher out of nevada that can feed his family feed his friends and feed his friends family the george soros and the bill gates and those kind of guys are not going to be able to control those people because we're going to feed them right and they've got to get rid of ranchers they've got to get rid of big game i mean all these wolves that are wiping out these elk and moose and, and deer populations that's not that's not just coincidence in my opinion yeah and i don't think it's conspiracy theory when <laughs> she's asked point blank do you want to put restrictions on food on red meat yeah. and she says yeah. yes um, so we're going to eat lab grown crickets and our lab grown beef and crickets and imported beef. That's the thing about imported beef is they control it, right? It's like a cow in a krill. 
you control the food that she eats. So yeah. even the wildest cow on the ranch is subservient to whoever's feeding her. And so they can bring beef in from Brazil, but it has to come through the government. So they'll control it. And, right. and once they get rid of us as ranchers and independent beef producers, and they control the lab grown beef, they control the imported beef and they control the farms. All these people are, de- are dependent on the government. So September 28th. Yep. You got a All sale to get to today. Where are, we, where are we at for time? You got to get out of here. Oh, I don't even know what time it is. No, I still got it. Yeah. I got, got a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. So we have a feeder sale Friday, the 27th of September. I don't know how many cattle we'll have, you know, probably a couple thousand. And then on Saturday, we'll have all the rodeo events that morning, and then we'll roll into the rally Saturday afternoon. And then the, the big cattle auction here uh, Saturday evening for, you know, the cattle that are donated for Trump. And then Sunday, we'll finish up with the, uh, with the rodeo events and then, you know, doing all the paperwork, getting, getting the money to the campaign. Yeah. And Corbett's coming. Corbett's coming. Yep. Um, so there's, there's one big name celebrity you'll have. Uh, we don't even need Trump. We got Corbett. <laughs> yeah. um, are there other, do you do you have other people flying in? Like I, I we've talked. I would I would love to be out there and do that. We got so much going on, and I'm gonna I'm gonna be speaking in Bismarck for the for the I band deal the weekend before. So, yeah. um, hopefully yeah. a bunch of guys from the U.S. Cattlemen show up. Uh, I hope the RCAF guys show up. You know that's that's one thing I wanted to, to talk about in this. Uh, podcast if we had a chance is just trying to to unite these associations because we really don't have that much um difference of, of opinions we have you know pretty much right. the same opinions. it's just some some old bad blood from whatever happened however many years ago that, that i wasn't involved in and yeah i think if, is... if, uh, if ncba can keep u.s cattlemen's association and, and our cow fighting with each other then they're going to be able to go into Washington as the big old cattlemen's association that represents everybody. But if, if these two associations can put the past behind them and, and walk in there in lockstep as two grassroots associations of guys that are, that are connected to the ground, you know, our cowboy hat actually is, is the right size for our head. And, uh, you know, I laugh at those guys that looks like their hat comes out of the box once a year, you know, but that they're big cattlemen. I think that we, we could go in there and actually get, some momentum and, and talk about these real issues that we're, that we're talking about here today, imported beef, mandatory animal ID shoved down our throats, the big fire situation. You know, you, you, you hear these ranchers talking about the, the head fire guy says, says things like if this fire goes for two more days, I'll be able to get my, my second daughter through college. It's like, you're just burning up all this wildlife habitat and a rancher's livelihood. And that's what you're thinking about is how you can keep the fire going. So those are the conversations that we need to have with with the Trump administration of yeah actually going on. You know, he implemented his uh, what did he call it? executive order for um, fuels reduction in 2018. And you walk into these BLM offices and talk to them, and and they don't even know what you're talking about. You know, so he needs to know that that executive order was 100 percent ignored. In that executive order, it talked about targeted grazing. I've applied for it on my ranch uh, four years in a row, and you might as well be, be speaking Chinese. It's just, it's not an option, you know? Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Anything else you want to talk about? Oh, we could go on for, for hours, but I think. I know I, I was trying to go through an outline now. It's like, well, I could do three different podcasts and then when we get into it, it kind of goes quick. Yeah. Um, on all yeah the animal animals. ID, one of, one of our biggest, biggest hangups on the animal ID is just the abuse of who, who has the numbers, you know? Um, first off, they're going to have the IDs made in China. I would imagine everything's made in China. So what's to say they can't put a, another little chip in there that we don't know about high frequency that, that lets China know exactly where our cows are and how many, you know? Yeah. And that's one thing you brought up that I hadn't really heard talked about is there's a discussion on the frequencies of, of the ID of the, the electronic IDs, um, and that, that changes the distance they can be read from. Mm -hmm. Um, So if you have something with a real high frequency, you talked about, you could fly a drone over and count. Right. Look at RFK, you know, talking about USDA and and how corrupt they are and and their connection with big pharma and ultra processed food. And, you know, he he, he really opened uh, some eyes there in that, in that speech. And so as a rancher, do you really want a USDA that is, that is working to get rid of, 
you and your industry to be able to fly over and, and count your cows. Right. Yeah. I'm, I'm not ready to go there. Yeah. And if you look at what they've done, their main focus is to get people kind of on the, on the payroll really as far, and then be able to control their land. That's something I've been going through and then CBA, the sustains act deal where, where corporations can partner with, um, the federal government and, and for the, all these climate change deals. And, and really, I feel like the main goal for that is just control mm -hmm. of the land. Like they don't need to come in and take it if they right. can control you through, through all their different programs. One of the things I want to bring up about, about fires is, uh, you know, I don't have the exact numbers, but I think I heard that the paradise fire in California a couple of years ago did more damage to the environment in the ozone than all the cars in California since 1987. Yeah. You're telling me we could have stopped or uh, not stopped, but prevented one fire and, and saved all the emissions from every car since 1987. I mean, that just blows my mind. So, I mean, right now, there's so much smoke out here. Fallon hasn't been bad, but you go into Oregon and stuff. I mean, you can't see your hand in front of your face. The smoke is so bad. So, I mean, let's just talk about health for one thing, but then jump into to global warming and, and all that. If, if we're going to go down that road, these cattle are actually carbon, carbon, not only carbon neutral, but carbon negative. If, if you throw in the fire portion and the smoke and yeah. the fire reducing, you know, yeah. but nobody's thinking about that. I just don't understand why we're spending so much time talking about, global warming and, and carbon emissions and our footprint and all that. When the truth of the matter is we need to be talking about how cows are environmentally friendly and, and what they're doing to prevent fires, which is the real uh, ozone problem, you know? Yeah. Well, to me, what I've always said is, I mean, it just kind of shows their hand is they don't, it's not about carbon emissions or, or climate or any of that stuff. It's always just been about control. So, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> that's so, how I feel like. We can't be talking about stuff like this because it might get somebody thinking, you know. So these, yeah. these are why we need Trump, and these are the reasons why we need to have a, a voice to to talk about these things that doesn't go through the big cattlemen associations that that may not be telling the whole story, you know. Right, the corporate, I would say, yeah, uh, the corporate yeah. backed. I didn't want to bash NCB on here too much because a lot of those guys they need Trump in there too. So right. Yeah. We could we could save that maybe, but um, I mean they should be coming out to your rally and helping you out too. Yeah, there's great guys in that association. I just oh yeah, challenge I challenge them to look at things more critically than just look at stuff that Dad told them to think. You know, right? Like there's a lot of stuff out here. If you read the signs, there's a lot of stuff going on that just doesn't add up. So make your own decision. Look look at stuff critically and and decide for yourself don't just go with the flow and, and regurgitate the talking points from 25 years ago yeah and that goes back to trump like don't vote for somebody who if you don't like your personality or something like that if you look at the issues like yeah. and you look at actually what this would do for rural america um what restriction on red meat would do for a cattle market um you talk about how it, it these black swan events and different things like that. If she gets in there, the second she's elected, I would say, you know, someone who who wants a restriction on red meat that that'd be a black swan event um, to okay. to tank the market. But yeah, I mean, look at look at the 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 guys with the most money in this country, like Warren Buffett. Look at them pulling their money out of the stock market. You know, yeah. those are that should be very very alarming. If guys like that. First off, it scares me if he's pulling his money out. He thinks that she has a chance of winning, and um, you know that's why every every vote is going to count. Every grassroots organization like this, we, we need to be doing all we can can do. Yeah. To, even if 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 we only affect ten votes, it, it literally could be the difference between a recount or or a win for them. Yeah, all the votes will count, including the twenty million illegal. <laughs> right. Right. And all those in the cemetery. They've got registered yeah. <laughs> and they're paying. Yeah. And I was talking to a guy yesterday. And he said a lot of that isn't to get them to vote. It's just to affect the number of people in that district so that that district now has two, two yeah. uh, instead of one. So the illegal that came in might not be voting, but he right. just, that, that district up by a million people. Now they get to send two people to Washington instead of one. Yeah. And if it's 
blue, if it's in a blue, you know, it's down around LA or somewhere, you know that that one isn't going to be a Republican. Yeah. And I think Elon Musk, he's, he's put a lot of the different stuff out there and how the, that goes into where they're sending them, you know, by the bus. Gabbard talked about how they, she went to the border and they came across the border and they hand them a check and they hand them an airplane ticket. Um, and and just send them all over, you know, wherever they want to go. I guess um, wherever they need a need a few. Yeah, guys wherever to... they need them. I guess yeah. huh. it's a weird, weird world we're living in, buddy. Yep, I agree. <laughs> so all what right. else? You got to get to work. What do you do during sale day? I just work the ring. Yeah, like oh, you're I, just in I, the I, ring. I work huh? the auctioneer because I. You know, I get to looking at the cow and I'm thinking about what she's going to, you know, who's going to buy her, what's she worth, is she cavy? I, you know, I'm always looking at things like that. I would be an absolutely horrible auctioneer. Yeah. I can Did run that out. One of the things that we try to do, you know, a lot of buyers are going to want one out in the ring. You know, they're always going to find one they want out. So so you're sorting in the ring, huh? Yeah, I usually know which one in there probably is the one that, that I would want out. And sometimes I'm right, sometimes I'm wrong. But if I can get that one sorted out while the auctioneer is still selling them, we can keep that momentum of the sale right moving you know so yeah my spot yeah all right well, yeah you you get your schedule changed so you can get out here and uh we well guys i was up. thinking if we got a big like we've got i've got all kinds of stuff we'll get kids stuff going on and then it's we might even be starting harvest by that time so and i'm already taking off i can't imagine getting on a, two different airplanes two different airplanes in one week. So when I usually don't get on an airplane every couple of years. So yeah, I understand. That's just, it's a lot, but yeah. Well, keep spreading the word and um, yeah. yeah. We'll just see how it goes. Is there anything, so as far as the fundraiser, is there anything like if people aren't able to come, it's on DV auction, right? Yeah, the sale will actually be on DV auction, but yeah, we got, you know, they can check out our, our website, NevadaLivestock.us. They can check out uh, Jack Payne on Facebook. All of that stuff will be on there for the links they can go to. So that's our goal is to make this a national event, not just about Nevada. Right. You know, and so they, can they donate through there or you have a place that. where it goes to the campaign or? Well, yeah, it's through that link, but it'll tie the money to our fundraiser, right? So right. go to the campaign, doesn't come to us, but we have like a, a bundler number uh three six seven six eight is the number and so they got to make sure to put that on their check or or on that form so that the campaign knows the money came from us especially if we can get the campaign to if we can pitch them that ad idea of the, kind of the beef industry and how kamala will affect it we want as much money raised through this event as we can to to try to blast that campaign ad out there to you know the urban americans that, that really aren't thinking about where their yeah. food comes from. empty store shelves i guess Right. Exactly. But who knows what they're thinking about? <laughs> yeah, well, they're 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 fat and happy right now, and they don't care. But and just like I said, the, the the trucking industry, for example, they have so much more power than they think because they shut those trucks down for a couple of days, and just look at the snowball effect that has on on those cities. You know, like we're just so dependent on the government, it's just scary. Yeah. We were at the ship in Oregon shipping cattle, and uh, had a big fire there in Sands Basin, and it blew the you know transformers out or power poles or whatever. You don't even think about it, but you know, in that house at that ranch, there's an electric stove, electric fridge, electric heat. So we had to go to our, our neighbor's house, no 90 years old. He's out there making coffee on his, on his barbecue. It's like, it kind of opens your eyes just how dependent even we are as ranchers. You know, I grew up where there was no power and it was all wood heat and all that, uh, you know, and propane. So we were pretty independent, but we get luck, you know, used to these luxuries and, um, but yeah. there's going to be tough times if, if those kind of things come at us. So hopefully people kind of start thinking about, you know, those, those kind of things that could happen. Yeah. And there's a whole nother podcast. I feel like we could talk about how you grew up. Did yeah. you have water? Yeah. Like we had water. Yeah. There's an amazing spring comes right out of the side of the mountain there. It's the coldest. I hate water except for in the form of ice. Uh, oh. <laughs> Yeah, that water is so cold that there was there was no swimming. It's just a huge spring comes right out of the side of the mountain. But like, do, you had running water in the house. Yeah, it was all piped to the house. It was you had like it was, a. It's a really cool ranch, just in the middle of nowhere. It's very very unique, big old rim rocks and meadows and that huge spring. Yeah, and you're still running cows up there. Yeah, so my sisters have that part part of the ranch, and then my dad, you know, which is 
Good on my dad. He didn't need any more work, but he went and bought another ranch just so that his kids would have enough, you know, room <laughs> that, they, that they could all ranch. So <laughs> and that just comes back to what we do every day is we want to make sure that these ranches are, are big enough that our kids can make a living on them and that they can carry on. Yeah. And that, yeah. And that people are paying for beef and that you're not getting taxed out of business and all that stuff. I mean, that's what I mean. What's that? That the government isn't harassing you every day. Yeah. yeah. Right. I mean, that's a, that's really what the whole deal's about as far as the choice we got, I guess. Yeah. In November. So. All right. All right. Jim, good visit with you and uh, let's keep in touch. Okay.